thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Whitworth. I'm here at UNCG. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Enterprise Infrastructure. And I wanted to, um, one, let everybody know that we're not using slides in this panel. So uh, we wanted to have a conversation. Typically, when I think data and infrastructure, I get into architecture diagrams and slides and a lot of information that might bore a lot of people. So uh, depending on who you are, but I also thought it'd be interesting and also challenging just to have a conversation uh, and talk about some of the different challenges with the infrastructure and you know, where we see some things going. So uh, we'll start, I'll let our, our panelists introduce themselves. Name, rank, and serial? Um, yeah, you want to, how about tell us a little bit about your background. Um, and if you have any specific project or anything that you're working on, you can go ahead and share that too. Okay. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Director of the Texas Digital Library. So, um, TDL is a library consortium. We have 22 institutional members across the state of Texas, um, including four ARL libraries, but then a whole host of other institutions, public and private, that participate in the consortium. And we exist to build capacity, including infrastructure, both technical and organizational infrastructure for um, providing access to and preserving uh, digital objects, digital collections, research, special collections, and other materials that our library steward. So two years ago, a couple years ago, not quite, um, in early 2017, we launched a new data repository using open source Dataverse, which I think Alan mentioned earlier as part of um, some work that Emory is doing in archiving research data. And we host a number of other kinds of technology services too, institutional repositories, theses and dissertations, publishing, and some other things. But this was our first foray into the research data space. So we're still pretty young in this space. Um, it exists, this repository, as a really as a way for researchers to publish their data, curate it over the long term. It's focused on kind of the end products, such a thing exists for research data um, and publication of that data. And about 10 of our members, 10 of our 22 members participate in this service. Um, it's been a success for us. Um, it is limited in its utility. It's not a comprehensive research data infrastructure or solution. It's, a, it's the beginning of a research data uh, service, our suite of services through Texas Digital Library. But what it has allowed us to do and our members to do is have a seat at the table at their respective institutions as their institutions grapple with um, providing research data infrastructure on their campuses and to be a part of that solution. So I'll I'll stop there and kind of pass it along to Saeed. Hi, I'm Saeed Chaudhary. I'm the Associate Dean for Research Data Management at Johns Hopkins. I work in the Sheridan Libraries, and leads what they call the Data Management Directorate. Uh, that includes the IT infrastructure and library applications around data, and also data services group, which comprises the GIS and the Data Management Services Group. Uh, I have a background and training as an engineer, so I, some, I told someone recently that my career actually is about trying to bring engineering practices into the library. That's been an interesting journey. Uh, in terms of data and infrastructure, uh, I've actually been interested in data since my undergraduate studies when I couldn't get my hands on data to help calibrate some simulation models I was building for natural disasters. I think it's very much the lifeblood of what now researchers need. Uh, data have been around for a long time, but the combination of data, software, and statistics is really changing the way people work. From the library's perspective, I've, I've said many times that I think data are a new form of collections, and we need to bring that sort of intentional collection development perspective and strategy that libraries have brought for many years to that realm. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, I point you to a report called Understanding Infrastructure. This was a workshop in 2006 uh, that NSF funded and was run by some social scientists 
who take an interest in historical view on uh, infrastructure development. And in many ways, I think a lot of what we talk about, what I will talk about, the projects of Hopkins Arts is systems. Um, I wouldn't call them infrastructure, quite frankly. Uh, I think systems go here into infrastructure. We haven't quite reached that point yet. Uh, so that's something that I, I hope we can consider as well. And I'll end by saying infrastructure is uh, boring for a lot of people. Um, as an engineer, it isn't. It's very interesting to me. But I think we are drawn to the novel and the interesting and the new. Uh, so maybe what I would ask our community to start thinking about is maybe infrastructure should be thought of as a coral reef. Right? So coral reefs are interesting on their own, if you have a certain perspective. But they're really interesting to marine life. <laughs> uh, apparently something like less than 1% of the ocean is coral reef, but 25% of uh, marine life lives in coral ecosystems. I think infrastructure has that same kind of sort of attractive potential. I'll begin to pull that a little bit. Hey, uh, I'm uh, Jason Jones, the analytics and innovation manager for Guilford County Government. Uh, kind of feel like the oddball here uh, at the University. Um, my work is uh, slightly broader than it probably should be. Uh, I work on uh, internal, external innovation projects. Also work with uh, community university partnerships for the county, um, but also do uh, data analytics and business intelligence for the county. Um, my background is not in uh, uh, IT whatsoever. Um, I actually have a degree in public administration. I'm more interested, honestly, in um, city and county administration than anything else. But there was this need um, at the county for um, focusing on data-driven decision-making. Um, so I actually work out of the, the budget office, which usually uh, surprises some people, but uh, you'll notice in <coughs> that there is, there is quite a bit of rise in folks like me living out of IT in places like the budget office because we're closer um, to the policy makers and the decision makers. Um, my, my interest in this um, really is uh, kind of nerdy and uh, definitely love uh, working with data, um, but also like to help people solve problems. And, and I think uh, you know this is a huge component of that, um, building out the necessary infrastructure so that you are ready to solve problems, ready to answer questions. Um, and I do like a lot of the comments that I've heard today about focusing on people, um, because I think, honestly, from an infrastructure standpoint, I'm, I'm really not worried at all about what, what systems that we're building or what systems that we're managing or, or what source systems that we're tapping into. I'm more interested right now in what investments that we're making in people and culture so that we have that infrastructure built out um, uh, ready to, to help answer questions. Because honestly, if, if we're not investing in people and culture, um, the technology is easy to figure out. Uh, we can't uh, code a data sharing agreement. We have to sit down at a table and talk about that. Um, so my interest, uh, honestly, is more on the investment in people and culture, <coughs> and that infrastructure, and then figuring out the technology components later. Great. I thought an interesting place to start would be partnerships, which we've already heard a little bit of themes, and, and today we've talked about partnerships. Huh? But um, you know, share some experiences you have with successful maybe unsuccessful partnerships. I tried to sit in the second seat, so I'm going to be first. So, um, I mean, our organization is, is a set of partnerships in and of itself. Um, we have 22 institutional members who are partnering with us on our projects. Um, and I think, the data repository is an example of successful partnerships working. So in a number of ways and in a number of levels, we kind of sit in the middle um, between our members who are our partners and the Dataverse open source community and the larger kind of um, national and international research data communities um, and partner in both directions and connect those, those communities together. So our members, um, have a role in governing the service, um, the system of the Dataverse repository. We have a, a steering committee with representatives from each participating institution, 
who provide direction for development of the service, who uh, provide direction on policy, um, who share resources and bring in training and other resources for our larger um, Texas community of practitioners. So that's been a really successful partnership within our, um, our membership and within our community in Texas, and it's worked really well so far. Um, we're also charter members of the Dataverse <coughs> Community um, Global Consortium. I, there's several words in there. I'm not sure I got them all in the right order. But, um, and in that role, we play a, a part in developing an external partnership with um, Harvard, the Odom Institute, others who are using and developing on Dataverse. Um, developing a governance model for that project and I should say I think um, at TEL we're a really small organization and I, we serve a constituency and have an impact far greater I think than you know the number of staff that we have at TEL would um, indicate um, so we don't do a lot of greenfield development we we uh, rely on and participate in these larger open source systems and communities as a way to increase our own impact, um, but also to increase the chances of sustainability of the systems that we put in place. Um, and so partnerships are absolutely key, essential parts of, of the work we do. We wouldn't be able to do it without those <coughs> partners. Uh, I think of partnerships in broadly two categories, explicit and implicit. Uh, explicit ones, as you imagine, are where you intentionally are trying to work with someone else for a particular goal. I think two attributes that are really important are trust uh, and the alignment of self-interest. And, and your self-interest may be public service and maybe serving others. I don't mean it's selfish, but it's an alignment of self-interest. Those are difficult things to, to have in place. I think they're sequential. I think the trust needs to be there to actually believe that you can align those interests in, in the way that I'm describing. Not surprisingly, the ones that have worked well, we've had those things align nicely, and the ones that haven't worked well, we didn't. Uh, they also tend to be more likely for grant funding, for example, because you are, in essence, bringing two sort of perspectives of partners together. Uh, grant funding has a lot of positive benefits in trying to approach it that way. Uh, we've had, you know, I'm, I'm glad to say, a lot of success with astronomers, medievalists, different kinds of communities with, with that approach. More recently, I would say we experienced what I think of as the implicit partnership. So one of the things we've done over the last 22 years, I guess, uh, is build something called the Digital Library of Digital Manuscripts. It started out as a particular manuscript collection called the Vermont the Roads. It's moved into other things like your student design uh, and early printed books. I'm an engineer, so please don't ask me what any of those are from a contact perspective. Um, I, I think one word we heard in the last session was efficiency. So when we took the first 12 manuscripts and brought them into what was the system back then, uh, we went to the Mellon Foundation for a $750,000 grant in order to do that. The next 120 that came from the National Library of France, we needed $150,000. So 10 times more manuscripts, one-fifth the amount of funding. Uh, there's one organization, which I will not name, uh, that we had been chasing from the very beginning of this journey. And their initial response to that first stage was no, we don't want to participate. Uh, at the second stage, their, their response was we'll participate, but it'll cost you $80 to follow you up. Uh, and my response was, I'm in the wrong business if you can generate $80 to follow you up or something. Most recently, they approached us and said, we'd like to include our manuscripts in your system. And the response was yes, and now we can do that in a week. So I think the efficiency of coherent something into these systems, or infrastructure if you want to call that, has profound implications for people eventually coming to you through these kind of implicit partnerships. So uh, partnerships is a big, a big part of what I do, so I'll try not to talk about this too long. But uh, I think I can run out of the room with the mention uh, we are, Metro Lab partners with UNC Greensboro. Um, we really value that relationship and we look at that as an opportunity to, uh, again, be more data driven and try to look for opportunities um, where 
we have interesting questions and um, investigators at the university have interesting questions. Where do those overlap and then how can we speed up some sort of exploration? Um, I like uh, uh, what you mentioned uh, around implicit explicit. And, uh, what resonated with me there was um, to make us better partners for folks, one of the things that we did was actually put our entire office through an adaptive leadership course. And the, the first thing that you kind of get exposed to there is the illusion of the broken system. Um, and not approaching folks from the standpoint that you're trying to fix something for them. It's just, I'm, I'm coming at you trying to understand um, why the system is set up the way it is and why you do things the way you do and why you make this decisions the way you make them. Um, so any, anyway, I, I'll just mention that. If anybody's interested, it's very worth your time, uh, very much so worth your time. But uh, um, we have a lot of different partnerships um, with uh, different community partners, university partners. Um, the Community Indicators Project right now in the county is, is a pretty big one, um, focused on building out um, some of that relational infrastructure I was talking about but also um, an open source data framework for um, being more responsive to community needs and um, giving uh, government, nonprofit, university stakeholders more access to information to ask better questions, answer things in a more timely way. Um, we, we've got uh, um, other explorations with folks outside of the state, like. Uh, the Masters in Urban Spatial, Spatial Analytics Program at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we're doing a project where we're trying to build out um, a, a better understanding of recidivism for the county and more appropriately target uh, reentry resources using county public safety data um, that the students can interact with. Um, one of the things that I find most valuable about these interactions is, is actually I probably shouldn't say this was actually not the end result of the project. Um, I, want, I want that question answered. I want that deliverable. Um, but honestly, these engagements have, has, have helped us understand our infrastructural deficiencies better. So where is our data not documented appropriately to answer questions? Where are we not equipped to transfer information to folks in a safe way? Um, where are we not resourced to uh, interact with the, with the external folks? Um, and um, it's also helped us kind of challenge some of our own um, assumptions and challenge some of our uh, rhythms, I would say. Because um, when you engage with uh, students, uh, you, you never really know what you're going to get. Um, and sometimes, I think, uh, people kind of scoff at the idea that, uh, you know, I think I heard someone say one time like their job is to walk in stupid every day. Um, but that's actually a really refreshing thing to have when you have a student walk in that knows nothing about what you do and you're engaging in a project with them and they, they ask a really simple question. We have a very relatively small scale infrastructure that we're, if we want to use the term infrastructure, system that we're running to use that say better descriptive term. Um, which is the open source dataverse repository running in um, Amazon, the Amazon Cloud, using Amazon S3 as its storage backend. And we're in the process right now of integrating that uh, repository asset store to um, a di distributed digital preservation system, which we also partner with, which is Chronopolis, based at UC San Diego. We serve as a node for that distributed system um, using assets at the Texas Advanced Computing Center in Austin. So, um, you know, that's the that's the infrastructure in a nutshell. Um, in addition to that, and just kind of echoing some of Jason's points, I think one of the key things that we provide um, is that organizational infrastructure, that human capacity. Um, we do a lot of community building, we do collective policy setting, we do training, and that part of our infrastructure is something that gets overlooked sometimes, but is absolutely essential and in some, some ways more important than the technology um, 
pieces that um, that we bring up. I think we've had the experience over the years of bringing up platforms for use by our members or by faculty at their institutions, and it doesn't matter how great the technology is if nobody has the capacity to utilize it effectively or confidence in their ability to utilize it effectively. And so I think the over the last couple of years in particular, we've the pendulum um, has swung in terms of our focus towards that community development and making sure we're bringing our people along with the systems that we bring up. There's two communities we've been working with along this uh, over 20 years in each case. One is these medievalists, the other is astronomers, and I think they're useful thinking of broad categories in terms of scale, the complexity, and so on, the data and the systems. With the uh, medievalists, it took us a long time to sort of understand their research questions and, and the way they're approaching uh, their, their data. The same is true with astronomers. They're both asking really important and interesting questions. It's just the level of computing and statistics that's involved is very different. And that's really sort of the biggest differentiator. I've had the most amazing conversations with the medievalist astronomers in terms of what they're trying to answer. But they just use different methods and tools. In the case of medievalists, since those tools are a little bit more accessible to us, in many cases it's simply just looking on the screen. Right? Uh, we have been able to build the, the systems to support the data directly. So we use some of the things you may be familiar with uh, in, in our community as your repository uh, that the, the, the promise in many ways to Fedora has always been that you can attach multiple layers or applications or views on that, and we're getting there. We're just about at that point where you can put the data into that repository and use different kinds of applications to look across those things. Uh, in many ways, though, what was interesting about the work with the medievalists is change the way they ask questions. So there's two big ex exchanges that were important as we were demonstrating uh, early versions of the system. One of them said, you're, you're making this too lexical, you're making this too mechanical. I still want to scroll through one at a time. It's still important for me to do that. We didn't have that functionality at the time. So we actually put in a page term, for example. Um, with the astronomers, it's more complicated. <laughs> um, it, it's not just understanding or learning their domain. The, the computational techniques, the statistics, and so on, are just much more complicated. Um, we have kept 140 terabytes of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, data over these past you know, 10 years. Uh, and we are at the layer, of, I would say, of sort of the basic levels of preservation, uh, just integrity of the bits, but frankly, slight help in terms of uh, maintaining protocols and so on. But we don't have those in the system that we serve without. We, what we managed to do with the medievalists is sort of building that community, I think that's really critical, and having people come there, we haven't done yet with these one but I'm glad to say that they're actually interested in doing that now. So I think the big lesson with the astronomers is no matter how smart, how clever, or how many resources they have, time is on our side. <laughs> in the sense that they're finally getting tired of having to deal with all these data, and they're moving on to the next astronomy, uh, or the next big telescope project. So we're now finally starting to ask this question, who's going to maintain this stuff for the long term? It really shouldn't be done. So I think we're getting to that point with them as well. So in terms of infrastructure, um, I'm pretty quick to point out, I work out of the budget office, so I, I don't technically manage any of our source systems, thank God. Um, but I'll give you the same answer most of them give me. Um, that's proprietary information. Um, so, <laughs> Um, we, we, I mean, we work with a lot of vendors, have a lot of different source systems. Um, our data infrastructure, in terms of uh, trying to answer questions faster and building that out, um, a lot of my ETL pipelines and those processes were constructed in R, um, which I've gotten a lot of criticism for, uh, but it's the language that I know, uh, and I'm the only one doing the work, so that was cool. Um, we use um, Power BI as our business intelligence platform. Um, we recently had uh, an open source uh, CCAN open data instance, but we've recently discontinued that just because 
uh, it was really cost ineffective. Um, so we're transitioning to like an Azure Open Data Platform because it's just included uh, in your enterprise contract and all that stuff. So um, our, our infrastructure is pretty basic. Um, but uh, um, the, 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 the part that really um, uh, we're focusing on and trying to figure out right now, um, I, I like uh, where he was headed actually, is this um, sort of human-centered design um, concept where you're, where you're trying to understand uh, what is most uh, useful, usable, and used. Uh, and that was, a, that was a nice framework that a uh, data scientist from the state of Massachusetts actually gave me. Um, he just mentioned that one of his colleagues said that you know, every, everything that he, he or she works on, they always start from the standpoint of, is this useful, is this usable, is it used? Um, and so you know, a lot of the work that I do is uh, meeting with folks, um, trying to understand are the products that we're delivering, or um, the tools that we're giving you access to, or these different uh, systems that we're maintaining and building, regardless of whether we build them ourselves or we purchase them from a vendor, is, is this what you actually need? How are you using it? How is it helping you answer questions? How is it helping you ask better questions? Um, and then as uh, sort of going from there to try to either support that better or redesign it. Um, and I think you also brought up something that is, uh, that's been a huge consideration for me, is uh, not just going <coughs> off and um, building something that looks really good or sounds really good to me, um, but is not sustainable or supported by our uh, information services group. Um, so that's something I've, I've learned as I've gone that um, uh, an important consideration in all of this is not you know, just what's, what is the fanciest, shiniest thing that you can do or build, but what is something that you can uh, put together that meets the needs of your end user, but is also uh, long-term maintainable by the folks that are gonna have to maintain it. Great. Chris, you mentioned you know, community building as infrastructure, right? And it's piece of it gets overlooked a lot and people don't think about. I'm curious, you know, either expand on that or are there other areas when you're doing infrastructure planning that you feel get overlooked or you've seen get overlooked on projects? Yeah, so that is the, the socio and socio-technical, I think, is the is the is a piece that often gets overlooked. Um, and you know, one example of that is not specifically related to research data necessarily, but we provide digital preservation, access to digital preservation storage services to our members. And we brought up systems to allow them to do that quite a few years ago. And the uptake on those services was close to nil. And what we found was um, institutions were not ready they didn't have workflows, they didn't have policies for prioritizing um, their digital collections, they didn't have workflows for packaging up their digital collections for, for digital preservation storage. They didn't have a person assigned to that work, or maybe they did, but that person was also doing five or six other things. Um, and they didn't have budget for it. They, it was not embedded into the work of the library at all. And so um, we had always, or for quite a few years, seen ourselves as this provider of technology, um, but quickly realized that um, that wasn't enough, that the build it and they will come approach, whether that's through focusing on developer-centered design rather than user-centered design, or whether it's just bringing up systems because people say they need them and hoping they figure out how to use them, but that isn't good enough. So we did a number of things. We, we hired somebody, <laughs> that was one thing. Um, and in some cases, who have the capacity to build, um, but there is research going on, there is data being produced at lots and lots of smaller non-ARL, non-R1 institutions, and, and bringing those voices to the table, making sure there's a diversity of, of voices in the development of infrastructure is really important. 
And finally, I will say that um, one more thing that I think is overlooked is, and this has been talked about some today already, is that building infrastructure and thinking about the timeline for funding infrastructure in an environment where the incentives to use it are not in place, um, that there's a long timeline uh, that's necessary to get people on board with using new services or, or, or changing their habits. Um, research data, and particularly research data sharing, is a good example of this. We have, we have a long history and entrenched um, and entrenched norms of researchers not sharing their data, and there are lots of um, barriers, you know, in place um, across a lot of disciplines. Um, expecting people to change those habits and norms overnight is unrealistic, and so we have to have the funding timelines, uh, you know, commensurate to that kind of institutional cultural change. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> uh, so, in, in terms of this, you know, people community dimension, uh, I'd mentioned this report, understanding infrastructure. The, the four researchers involved that were Paul Edwards, Jeff Bauer, Stephen Jackson, and Corey Knowles. These are social scientists who've been looking at infrastructure. One thing that's interesting, not only in that report but subsequent uh, articles they've written is they've looked at historical infrastructure and seen the amount of time before the impact really becomes widespread. Uh, and interestingly enough, it's roughly 30 years. So give or take you know, a decade here or there. And this goes all the way back 150 years to railroads and so on. Technology's changed tremendously in 150 years. People have not, right? <laughs> so, so getting that people and community dimension takes time. It, it, regardless of what the technology is, regardless of what the context might be, it just takes a certain amount of time. And I think it's interesting, we use the term internet and web synonymously, they're, they're not, right? The internet came out in the 60s. I don't think it's a coincidence that about 30 years later, the web came out. Uh, in many ways, the web was a victory of HTTP as a protocol. I'm, I'm old enough to remember FTP, and Gopher, and, and Archie, and Veronica, and Jughead, and not just comic book characters, but, Mining tools built on Gopher and so on. HTTP was kind of those different communities and systems vying with each other and coming out and saying, we're going to do it this way. So I'm curious about you know, 30 years from 1993, it's 2023. We're not that far away from that. So, in terms of the, the user perspective, it is critical, there's no doubt, but what's going to be that big breakthrough, right? So, Henry Ford was attributed with, and I'm curious who he may have talked to uh, as well in terms of coming up with this quote, if I ask people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So the automobile was user-centered, but in a in different and kind of novel way. And my understanding is the original cars were really badly made, right? You would literally have to turn the motor, but you'd have to go in front of your car and do this. And many of them would turn on and run people over. Okay, so people were literally willing to die to keep trying this new technology out there. So what is going to be that major kind of big breakthrough that makes a lot of these things happen? In terms of what's being overlooked, I, the one that I think of more than anything is the, the corporate dimension. You know, there, there's a great book called Where Wizards Stay Up Late and talks about the creation of the internet and people that are involved, at least you know, who we know about explicitly. And the interesting aspect is the power dynamics between the U.S. government and companies. Very different. The U.S. government had the ability to tell AT&T or DAC or someone, you will do the following, and they did it. That is no longer true. You, you have Google talking about changing the URL, for example, right? And I'm sure they're doing it because they care about my security and my privacy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they literally have the, the gravitas, you know, the have to basically have this conversation. It seems unfathomable to me that a private company could basically show up and say, yeah, let's just change the structure of these things because we don't like it. We think there's a better way to do this. So for the next round of infrastructure development, these companies are going to have enormous influence on what happens, and I don't know if we reconcile what that really means. Our, our biggest challenge in terms of uh, uh, data infrastructure, I would say, is really just along the lines of um, documentation 
and, um, and governance principles, I guess, um, which maybe sounds a little um, basic. Um, but what I, what I found in the short amount of time that I've been doing this work is uh, that uh, if people would rush to uh, the uh, technology conversation, you know, what, what technology stack are we going to leverage um, to make X, Y, or Z happen? Without first considering um, interoperability, like I mean that that is a term that gets uh, thrown around a lot. But are we are we kind of backing ourselves into a corner to now? This is one uh, we may not be able to get the existing information into this new system, um, and we don't understand it well enough to do that in a good way. Um, or uh, we're backing ourselves into a corner where we now can't share information. With in an easy way. Um, so one of the one of the things, like I said before, that I've, I've really been focusing on to try to address this challenge is is really trying to manage data as an asset. Um, we spend a lot of time and money on managing other assets. Um, we don't necessarily spend as much time focusing on data like it's an asset, um, and we we certainly don't um, we certainly don't have sufficient uh, metadata documentation on all of our source systems. We don't have sufficient standards uh, for creating the data in these source systems. Are we letting people do freeform text entry or are we going to make some sort of data validation process? Um, and that these are really basic things, um, but they're being overlooked every single day and they're being overlooked every single day in our purchasing processes as well. Um, and to mention purchasing, I'll also say a challenge from infrastructure and planning is, um, is duplication. So a lot of, you know, for government, a lot of our challenges can stem from uh, duplication through purchasing. Um, people are allowed to uh, purchase and create things uh, in the same way in multiple places, and then they end up doing, the implementation is different in all the different places. Um, so that's a huge challenge. But honestly, you know, if I had to focus on one thing, it is that really basic, just how are you managing your metadata? How are you, um, how are you creating standards around the creation of this data in the source systems? And then can you, you know, to what he was alluding to or what he directly mentioned, can you create some sort of uh, community agreement around uh, transfer standards? And I'm not necessarily talking about like, I'm going to send you a JSON file, cool. No, um, it's when you get that JSON file, if there's an address in it, this is what, how, what it's going to look like. If you get it and there's a zip code in there, this is what it's going to look like. If you get it and there's a name in there, this is what it's going to look like. Um, and having agreed upon community standards for that so that you can have that um, enablement to answer questions faster. It's not about the what system you use, honestly, you know, I don't care what vendor you go with or, or what database you store your information in, but if we're going to work together on a project and we're going to share information, let's agree what that information is, let's agree on what that information is going to look like when we share it. Chris, you mentioned AWS. Um, so we're going to move to cloud infrastructure, right? <laughs> you have to talk about that now when you talk about infrastructure, I feel like. so. Um, you know, with cloud infrastructure, and so you also you mentioned the role corporations have. You know, all the big providers are private corporations, right? So, um, you know, with cloud infrastructure, how does that impact your planning? Any difficulties that you had to overcome that is very different than traditional? You know, buy everything up front and get a ten-year lifespan out of it if you're lucky. Kind of infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> is it easy one? Right. <laughs> Yeah, so <clears throat> I so before my time at TDL, the the decision was made to move virtually all of our infrastructure, um, with a few exceptions, into the Amazon cloud. And um, I think I mean the reasoning is the same as it has been for a lot of folks. It reduces the um, staff time and you know staff capacity needed. To manage things to a certain extent, um, although it changes the expertise needed, 
Um, it uh, made us more flexible. It made pricing a little more predictable, cost a little more predictable uh, in some ways. Um, but I, I, have con I have growing concerns about our reliance on it, and we've been looking at ways to reduce that reliance, um, particularly in the digital preservation storage area um, where Amazon doesn't provide a lot of transparency uh, into kind of what's going on. Um, so I'm not sure that that answers your question, but um, I, I think it has, it has made it easier in some ways for us to plan in terms of um, thinking about the costs of the service um, and what's required for it, but it locks us into um, a dependence on a commercial commodity provider that we don't feel 100% comfortable. Uh, in, in some ways, I think, uh, I don't know if any of you uh, or some of you read about MySpace losing, I think, 13 or 15 years of content that they can keep in front of people. To me, that seems like a very large example of the automobile running over someone. This is a disastrous event in, in many ways and, and has you know, affected a lot of people's lives and businesses in very profound ways. But I don't see anyone saying, well, okay, then let's stop using cloud providers. So to me, this is evidence that there's a demand here. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of things um, that, we're, that we're maybe not paying as much attention to, that, like he said, in terms of conditions. And uh, I think a big thing that's going to come up a lot more and more as we start having these uh, conversations about integrated data and virtualization is, is how informed are the people uh, about what you're doing with their information, their data. Great. So last question before we open it up to questions, um, and this is kind of a crystal ball question. So, you know, what's next? What should we be focusing on? What are the challenges out there? What excites you? What concerns you when it comes to data and infrastructure? Okay, that's a big one. So I think some of the things that, in terms of challenges, I think some of the things that are the biggest challenges have haven't changed. I think uh, sustainability and the growth of data, those are challenges that we have to deal with. Um, uh, I know within TDL, dealing with larger data, you know, larger and larger data sets and how we can provide access to storage for those and, you know, high performance computing resources and things like that to support, um, to support data. Uh, effective curation of data, so making sure it's described, making sure it's um, described according to standards that other people use so that um, they can be um, discovered and reused. I think that's a huge issue and it's not one that we've cracked, um, in part because it requires a lot of human intervention and um, Humans are kind of in short supply sometimes when it comes to the you know the scale relative to the scale of, of the problem. Um, in terms of concerns and hopes um, for this space or things that I'm excited about, one of my concerns is something that has kind of been a theme throughout a number of the presentations today, which is that the public will for investing in infrastructure for this kind of thing, I mean, will, will not be there, um, or that it will erode further. And, you know, I think at least in Texas, the, the public will for investing in higher education itself is um, suspect, much less massive infrastructure projects and the, the human resources to do this work. So I, I worry about that. I think that the, the best way for us to build and sustain infrastructures and networks is collaboratively and governments are well positioned to support um, that kind of thing but at least in the U.S. it's kind of a hard sell so um, we're, we're doing it kind of bootstrapping it a little bit um, within our communities um, but you know I worry about the long-term sustainability of that but I am excited there's I think there's a lot to be excited about um, 
not exactly related to data, but someone mentioned earlier the Elsevier, the UC um, uh, termination of the, their Elsevier agreement. Um, there's a lot of conversation going on within open source communities about sustaining open infrastructure and how we respond to this moment when the, you know, Elseviers of the world are really kind of trying to take over the full research uh, and scholarly publishing life cycle and all the data and information that goes along with that. What can we do as community partners to, to sustain and rationalize and cohere the systems that we support? And I think that represents a pretty exciting moment um, of, of hope and I have some cautious optimism about our ability to do that and really strengthen the, the infrastructures that that we support um, on behalf of open content. Uh, I'll pick one thing that excites challenges and concerns me simultaneously, um, and that, that is machine learning. Uh, and, and I think that you, many of you probably heard this term algorithmic bias. It's an interesting question about whether it's the algorithms that are biased, or is it the data sources that are biased, or the way that we process or infer from those data sources. But one of the interesting and most promising things about infrastructure is it can be very inclusive. It can provide services for a wide range of people in a way that maybe it didn't in the past. But if we keep reinforcing the biases and, and the yeah, sort of limited viewpoints we've had in the past, it will only get worse. And it will get worse on a much larger scale because these machine learning algorithms will be everywhere. Uh, I heard a researcher at Hopkins recently tell me that he thinks we're not that far away from machines designing experiments. So it's very interesting when you say you know, machine learning is going to take over certain kinds of jobs that you know, may, may be more familiar in that conversation. It's interesting to be in a room of researchers and hear one of their own say, machines are going to design experiments. I've never seen people get agitated so quickly. <laughs> but how are they going to design, design those experiments? What data sources are they going to use? I think these are profound questions that need to be addressed. And in many ways, this is a question of transparency. Uh, but this, again, brings me back to the question of private or you know, for-profit entities are providing a lot of these kinds of tools and a lot of these services they have. Do we know what these things are doing and that would make a bigger decision? Yeah, I, I would absolutely jump on that one for sure. That's the one of the biggest things that concerns me. Uh, and I would I would completely uh, throw all my eggs in the data creation basket, I think, um, for uh, machine learning and algorithmic bias. I, yeah, I think a lot of it is in the data creation part. Um, the, uh, the Analytics Frontiers conference we were at earlier, uh, Jeff was there, um, and I think at UNC Charlotte, um, one of the, the statements there that I loved was that uh, data is not an objective truth, it's, it's more so a reflection of society. Um, so when we're mining data from these source systems that we have, that's something that I constantly have to reiterate with folks. Um, if I show you a chart or if I show you a business intelligence tool, please do not stop at, oh, um, there's X amount of people here, we need to target resources there. Don't, don't stop there. Um, it is not an answer. It is just a tool for you to ask better questions. Um, that is what I constantly have to try to reiterate to people. Um, because, it, it, like she said, at that, that, that uh, conference, it's not an objective truth. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll mention uh, that really excites me right now, especially in the government world, um, and I mentioned earlier uh, the Masters in Aerospatial Analytics program at UPenn. Uh, Ken Steiff and the folks that work with him there, um, they really focus hard on open analytics. Um, so they, they, they partner primarily, I think actually exclusively right now with local governments, and they take on open analytics projects, meaning um, everything that they do, all of the um, code that they write, all of their thought processes, Everything is documented and posted completely free and open source online for anyone to review and evaluate. Um, and I think that's extremely important, and I think uh, uh, Ken and, and 
his opinions on it. He, he does a far better job of articulating it than I do. But the, the open analytics movement um, uh, in local government is something that's really exciting to me. Uh, it's something that I think has a lot of uh, a potential to really impact uh, uh, policy decision making um, very, in a, in a big way, very soon. Uh, so we've talked, uh, heard you talk a lot about collaboration and partnerships in the course of this panel. And uh, just thinking about different types of partnerships out there, I wanted to get your take on one of the best types of partnerships out there. I mean, we have peer-to-peer -peer partnerships. Sometimes we see sponsorships, like in the case of open source software development, oftentimes a private company will sponsor an open source project. Uh, in the library of publishing world, we see a lot of membership partnerships. Uh, I'm just curious of, about your taking these different types of partnerships and how they fit into the whole ecosystem. Thank you. That's a good question. Anybody want to take it? I, when you mentioned those different kinds of partnerships, the word that came into my mind was business model, actually. Um, and, and I think that while there's overlap clearly between partnerships and business models, like in the Venn diagram sense, I think there's also some separation. I, I think some partnerships have nothing to do with how something gets sustained necessarily, but how something gets built, for example. Um, so I think that's 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 one thing that comes to mind. But I'll come back to what I think I said earlier that I don't think there's a formula that I would look to for a particular kind of partnership that works in a particular context. But if you don't have trust and that alignment of the interests, it's not going to go very far, um, regardless of what you're trying to do. And, and I think that in many cases, sometimes we try to make that happen without it building up over time. Um, I, I, you know, Jeff asked me how long I've been at Hopkins, and I said 22 years, which is a bit sober for me to think about. Um, but I don't think we would have been able to do what we've done with the Bedeevilists and these farmers if we hadn't worked with them for a long time. And I don't know that I approached them and said, let's partner on something together. I think it was just a, a process of building trust. Uh, and then eventually, if you, if you can do that, then the partnerships may sort of arise and evolve. Yeah, I, I think I'm the sentiment that I think all those kinds of partnership models can work in different contexts. Um, and I'll echo Saeed's comments that, that trust is so key to this part. I, I think it's more about the elements of a good partnership, trust, transparency, which you know, breeds trust, um, alignment of interests. And, and I would add to that results from a partnership. Um, I mean, I, I know from our own history as an organization that um, you can count on member support for so long before you got to show the goods, right? You have to have something to show for the trust that people are putting in you. Um, and I think honestly that that is sometimes a problem with community supported projects. Um, and, and research brought all kinds of different projects that involve partnerships is is the the lack of a sense of what the, you know what the end product is or what the result of, of the thing and that's all about trust as well yeah just super quick and super simple uh, a clear understanding of what's in it for both parties uh, that is probably uh, going to be the most beneficial thing that you can outline up front and keep in mind throughout the entire partnership. Um, but just mutually beneficial partnerships. If I can, if I can characterize a, a partnership that way, um, I would just say that, that that's always going to be, um, in my experience so far, um, the most uh, the most productive type of partnership is, is one that is clearly. Uh, clearly articulated in its in how it will be mutually beneficial to both partners. Great. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask a question based on something Saeed said at the very beginning, talking about scalability and asking this to the panel. Um, I think for a lot of the publishing challenges we see and why, for instance, you know, 
for profit publishing, as John said, you know, often seems to eat the lunch of nonprofits, and nonprofits are still much bigger than higher publishing programs. A lot of it, I think, has to do with the fact of the benefits of scaling your project. So that you get the sort of benefits I was talking about, where his, the cost of his digitization were dropping so rapidly. And so my question is, in all of your projects, what steps are you taking to realize intentionally those benefits of scaling, and how have you, how have you accomplished them? Well, I, I think John touched on some of them in, in terms of sort of harmonizing workflows, if you will. Um, and, and harmonization sometimes has a bad connotation of uh, reducing or, or sort of flattening what you're able to do, and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, so one of the real breakthroughs, I would say, in terms of what we've done with, with the manuscript work in particular is harmonize the workflow without compromising what the scholars are able to do. Uh, that's a very difficult thing to accomplish. It takes a lot of time to actually figure out what the scholars are trying to do to your point about understanding mutually beneficial outcomes. Beneficial outcome for us is reducing the cost, and making it more efficient, and so on. But in turn, that process can actually lead to some really amazing insights. So one of the things, and remember, I'm an engineer, so I'm gonna try to get this right. It, it, the medievalists who led this project talked about something called the Lacroix line number, which was used to basically you know, refer to portions of these, these texts, or these manuscripts. And he had rejected that for his entire career. He basically said, this is an artificial construct, this is a fixed edition viewpoint, something that should not have this, and so on. And as we explained how we were trying to think about the workflows, he came to us one day and he said, you know, I've had, a, I've had an epiphany. Every one of these manuscripts has the same scenes. Right? They don't have the same number of lines and so on and so on, but they all have the same scenes. Can we organize them in a way around scenes and then do the searching based on that? And we were able to do that. It happened to make things more efficient for us because we weren't sort of chasing this line number thing that we, quite frankly, I still don't fully really understand. Um, but it also led to a way for the scholars to use the data in a way that they never had before. So it, I'm not saying it's trivial, but it really is just a question of harmonization, but ultimately making sure the scholars are able to do what they need to do, and maybe even use things as well. I, I, I hope this is related to your question. I, I, wanna, I do want to draw attention to you. For us, um, one of the things that was maybe not unintentional, un, unintentional on our part, but a big um, realization as we worked through um, uh, some of this, some of these processes it is uh, shining, shining a light into a lot of uh, black boxes, and um, that has terrified people. Um, but the ones who have really, the few that have actually embraced it, um, have actually uh, come to a place now where they realize. Their work is, is more sustainable, more scalable, and they've now freed themselves up to do things that they could not previously do uh, by creating a black box around themselves. Um, so that it was something that was not unintentional, um, but uh, a very big benefit of a lot of the things that we've been doing. Yeah, I'll just say, I think um, for us, because we provide hosted services, the key to scaling has been standardization of our systems, standardization of deployments, um, the use of tools to automate deployments, um, and you know, automate other kinds of systems administration processes. So that allows us to host you know, hundreds and hundreds of systems with a very, very small staff. Um, the other thing we've done to scale, to help us scale a little bit, is revise our fee model. Um, I think when we first started, we had a very flat fee model. Members would join for a certain flat fee and that would get them access to everything. There was no mechanism for charging more for extra storage or anything like that. So we have had to, as we've grown, um, revise that model to accommodate, you know, 
people actually using services and, and storing things and, and paying for those costs. So I think you know that's part of the sustainability piece and the scaling piece for us. Great. Any more questions or do we want to move on to lunch? Well, I'm actually not a question. Um, so this goes back, so Kath and I did a book about 10 years ago about sustaining digital library projects and one of the core assertions in it was that uh, this notion that that we have we have a received notion of things being permanent or, or created permanently that that's inherently incoherent basically that it you know you can only make assertions about the sustainability of any service or content even for some period of time and you know, I think we have this received notion from maybe, you know, ideas of the mythology of the Library of Alexandria that survived some, or didn't survive forever, but somehow we're going to, you know, through benign neglect, books will always be there in the library. But I, I'd be curious to hear a final, you know, comment from anybody on the, the folks on the panel about, you know, to what extent do you think in terms of sustainability for periods of time? And you know, risk management in terms of periods of time rather than this notion of forever. You know, which I mean, we don't subscribe to a newspaper forever. You, you make a subscription for a year. You make you know, uh, you make service contracts for a period of time. Um, so I'm just curious to hear any thoughts you have on that. So so yes, I agree completely. <laughs> Um, I, I think of sustainability as the intergenerational transfer of risk. And, and what do you do to mitigate or lower the risk to the people you will never meet, but will be very angry at you in the future if they look at what you've done and say, why did they do it that way? Uh, and th there, are, there are ways we can do this. So to that question or, uh, about sort of efficiencies, Thinking about data models in addition to metadata schemas is a great way to reduce your risk over time. It's a great way to do things in the present, but it's a far better way to transfer and convey what you've done and sustain that and to try and map up metadata schemas in a pairwise arrangement. So there, there are practical things you can do as well, but I think the mindset really is, what, what am I passing on and how do I want to pass that on and make that easier for people? I think there's a lot of services out there that have made it a lot easier to um, not. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to say it. You know, you don't have to. You don't have to buy it. You just try it on for a little while. Um, so, like with our open data program, that was kind of the, the course we took with that open source seeking platform. We didn't. When we we were very intentional in the purchasing process to to build in and at the end of year two, we said. We are going to evaluate it then and, and say whether or not we want to continue this relationship, and we chose not to. But through the process of, of uh, building out our open data program, we kept in mind the whole time that this needs to be um, system independent. Like we don't we don't want this to rely on CCAN. CCAN is just a tool we were trying on at the time. And so like he said, it's, it's documenting what we're doing, it's documenting our processes in a way that is easy. It's, it's very interoperable, and it's easy to transfer to other people at times. Yeah, ditto. Um, I, all we can do is, is set things up well for the next group to you know, take up the mantle and continue the preservation of these resources. And the things that Said and Jason mentioned are all part of that. Um, I would add too that, um, you know, not everything needs to be kept forever. And um, that's hard for us, I think, to admit or acknowledge. And it is not something we have, we got, I can't say we've grappled with it um, really substantially either, but um, I think we, we will need to, I think we make, with our data repository, we make a 10-year commitment to the data that goes in. Um, 
when that ten when the, that first ten year mark rolls around, we're gonna have to make some decisions. So you know, we're starting now to think about what are the things that need to be kept. Um, what are the things that need to be kept accessible versus in a dark archive? What are the things that you know? Do we need every version of every data set, and who makes those decisions about what gets kept and what doesn't? So, I mean, I don't really have great answers to those questions, but I think they are important questions for us to ask. Not not everything from you know that went into the making of the Alexandria Library, you know was in the Alexandria Library. So what do we, what do, what is the most important thing for us to keep it, uh, indefinitely? All right, thank you, our panelists. So lunch, um, lunch is ready.